Hi, my name is Charles White, uh, and I'm a third year DPhil student at the Department of Geography and the Environment at the University of Oxford. And what I study is water scarcity, um, because I'm interested in understanding how we can share water better between uh, humans and the environment. Um, so the talk that I wanted to provide today um, is on freshwater scarcity, um, which uh, in simple terms is an imbalance of uh, demand and supply of water. So the objectives for today are quite simple and threefold. Number one, it's to demonstrate the global scale of water scarcity. Um, the second is to describe how both the environment and the economies are actually threatened by water scarcity today and in the future. And then three, uh, in closing, I'd like to offer ideas and evidence of ways to alleviate water scarcity and share water better between nature and people, um, both at the individual level um, as well as at the global level. So this is a map that I made a few years ago with some colleagues and what it's showing is how water scarcity has changed over time and in severity. So this video starts in 1900 and goes till 2005 uh, and the redder the basins are um, the more water scarce it is um, meaning that there's more water demand than there is water supply and so what you can see is that over this these 100 years um, not only has water scarcity spread um, in terms of its geographic uh, breadth, but it's also uh, gotten worse in the places that it was already existing. And so uh, it's within this context that we talk about um, why water scarcity is the way it is today and what we're going to need to do about it. So for multiple years now in a row, the World Economic Forum has labeled water scarcity as one of the greatest challenges of our time. And one of the reasons why is because it is a nexus uh, element. So that means that water is used in a lot of things, most things actually. So water is used in electrical systems. Water is used in manufacturing. Uh, lots of water actually goes into clothes. Water goes into food. And so when you talk about uh, either limited supply or an increased demand, aka water scarcity, um, it affects lots of different sectors, and so that's why the World Economic Forum has cited it as such a big risk. In terms of how it affects people, um, it's uh, quite uh, tragic in terms of uh, the scale. So it's hard to quantify this, but paper after paper has demonstrated uh, that depending on the technicalities about how you classify and how you quantify this, um, billions of people are probably affected um, at least a little bit of the year uh, by water scarcity. Um, and this obviously has uh, real implications and especially depends on, uh, on, a, on a lot of things, including what country you're in, uh, what gender you are, um, and your socioeconomic group. And so I don't, uh, I don't want to lose sight of that. Um, at the same time, uh, it affects livelihoods, especially from agricultural communities who, who rely on water. In addition to people, water scarcity affects the environment. So um, some of you may have heard of something called uh, the Living Planet Index. This is kind of an index fund, if you will, um, of species around the world. Um, it's uh, kept up by uh, WWF, and I've provided a link below if anyone wants to illustrate that. Um, the long story short is, um, and this probably isn't a surprise to you, is that uh, globally, um, Freshwater species are uh, imperiled, and actually, um, they are much more imperiled than their terrestrial um, counterparts. Um, what we have also shown, um, and what these graphics show, is that, well, also, when you have imperiled species who happen to be in basins that are actually water stressed, um, they're actually even more imperiled. That's not a surprising uh, revelation um, by any means, um, but it just underscores how... Um, species that are already imperiled um, for reasons uh, perhaps other than water quantity um, are further affected by uh, lack of, of water supplies. And this kind of gets into how much uh, demand, uh, if you will, do freshwater species need, which is an important variable in this equation. 
So what I wanted to try to do um, in this uh, interactive class is uh, to demonstrate uh, different scales of water scarcity in an interactive way. And so what I provided uh, in the links at the end and right here um, are three different interactive pieces of data so that we can kind of get an idea of water scarcity at the global level, then zoom in to the country level, in this case, England, um, and then down to uh, the local level. Why is this important is because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, water being a nexus element is that uh, decisions at all of these scales are important um, in terms of finding solutions uh, to the water scarcity problem. So let's... Okay, um, so this is one of the uh, activities, um, and this, um, after I'm done on this slide, uh, you, you can pause the video for a few minutes and, and play around. This uh, is a web application um, called the Water Risk Atlas by WRI, um, and basically what you will see um, is it's a really uh, friendly user interface, and you can zoom around the world, and you can look at different uh, attributes associated with um, water risk. So for example, uh, you on the left-hand side, you can click on things like water depletion and water stress. There's little bubbles with question marks that explain uh, in technical terms what each of these uh, attributes mean. Um, and you can start to see um, how in different countries of interest, um, the water risks and water scarcity um, affect different parts of different countries differently. Um, and there's actually a cool toggle where you can actually look at um, future projections as well. So um, if you'd like um, to pause the video here, explore some countries that are of interest to you, um, and we'll pick it back up when we zoom in uh, to England next. Okay, now that you're back from wherever you've been, um, this is the second activity. So as I've alluded to earlier, um, water scarcity, defined as an imbalance of uh, water supply and water demand, uh, can crop up in places that are uh, historically or anecdotally uh, rainy or wet places. England is a really good example of this. Um, the next activity, um, if you can pause this video and check out the link um, at the bottom of this slide, um, is a really good uh, five-minute video um, that talks about uh, the English context of water scarcity. So uh, we can pause this here um, and then um, pick it up in a few minutes. Okay, cool. I hope uh, y'all learned something from that as well. Okay, so for the last activity, um, uh, we're going to talk about and then we're going to interact with uh, the water scarcity calculator. So um, this is an idea uh, pioneered by uh, a Dutch professor uh, who unfortunately passed away last year, um, Arjun Okestra. Um, and basically the idea is that um, it's easy to understand how much water uh, you and perhaps your household use uh, on a monthly basis, for example, because uh, you probably pay a water bill, and that's probably associated with uh, a volume of water that you and everyone connected to that uh, household pipe uses, right? Um, however, uh, the amount of water that you're using on uh, a daily or weekly or monthly basis um, is not reflected by the water meter in your house because, as I mentioned earlier, water is an input uh, to a lot of goods and a lot of uh, things that you consume. So what uh, the water footprint tries to calculate is, okay, how much water are you responsible for uh, consuming um, if you take into account what kind of uh, food you eat, uh, what kind of things you drink, uh, where you get your food from, um, etc. And it gives you uh, a number, uh, based on a, a series of questions, basically. Um, and so in, in simple terms, uh, what you will find, and I encourage you to do this with, with friends or family uh, to, to compare, um, is that different behaviors um, and different patterns of consumption uh, will reflect 
a different water footprint. So uh, to take a very extreme example, um, if you are um, a meat eater um, who buys uh, their, their clothes from a place uh, w which is water scarce, um, and you drink a lot of coffee and wine, um, your water footprint will be higher than someone who is vegetarian um, and makes their clothes uh, from cotton, which is rain-fed grown, for example. So two extreme examples. Y'all are somewhere probably in the middle, um, but it just demonstrates that um, water as an input and how you as an individual interact with those uh, behaviors of consumption um, can alter your water footprint. So um, for the last activity, um, let's take a pause here. Uh, please go to the link provided below um, and fill out this quick questionnaire. And like I said, I think um, it's very cool um, on its own as kind of a baseline, uh, but where I think it gets more interesting is kind of compare how uh, you compare, for example, with a family or friend or how you would compare with you with slight changes uh, in some of these variables. So um, there's the link below um, and we'll see you uh, once you come back from that. Okay, thank you for joining me on what I hope was uh, an interactive uh, educational adventure um, on thinking about uh, freshwater scarcity. What I hope I've been able to convey uh, are three principal points. Uh, the first being that water scarcity is a growing challenge. Framed as an imbalance of supply and demand, what I hope this showed is that um, different parts of the world that may not have been on your radar for water scarcity um, are perhaps now viewed um, as a, a potential place for water scarcity. Um, and this includes uh, countries like England, uh, which is where y'all are, um, as well as uh, Costa Rica, which is uh, where I am. Um, viewed in this way, uh, uh, supply and demand, uh, we can think about how um, our actions um, at different levels, at an individual, at a state, at a country, um, and at a global level, um, affect that supply um, and demand equation. What uh, Number two, what I hope I've been able to convey is that water scarcity um, affects um, both uh, the environment and uh, the economy. So because water is an input um, on most things um, that we interact with, um, where there is not enough water to meet those demands, um, this poses challenges. So for freshwater species, when there is not enough water to meet their aquatic demands, this is a challenge for them, um, and they usually don't have voices uh, to speak up about this. Um, and likewise, um, companies and uh, communities that rely on certain amounts of available supplies of water um, are also faced with economic burdens when their demands are not met. So we need to be thinking about, uh, and what I hope I've been able to convey, is to be thinking about water scarcity um, not only in how it affects um, the economies um, and not only how it affects the environment, but how uh, these are interconnected. Um, and lastly, that um, the solutions for this may require some creative thinking and a focus on the demand side. A very short um, anecdote of this is to think about uh, Europe uh, and North America, how they, how their societies have historically uh, confronted the issue of water scarcity. So. Um, as y'all uh, may be familiar with, there's a lot of dams in Europe uh, as well as uh, North America. Actually, uh, so many that we in Europe and North America are not really building dams anymore. We're actually taking more down the building, which is a good sign for aquatic uh, freshwater species. But um, why they did that was that was an augmentation of the supply side. Um, and historically, um, a lot of societies have done that. Um, however, Lots of uh, recent uh, research demonstrates that dams are very costly, um, they're, they're environmentally pretty reckless, um, and actually they are also 
uh, pretty reckless in terms of how they affect uh, riverine communities. They look only uh, to uh, the Amazon in Belomonte, for example. Um, at the same time, um, demand side solutions uh, like changes in policy and water savings techniques um, consistently rank much cheaper um, in terms of a solution to mend that supply versus demand gap. Um, unfortunately, um, these kind of demand side uh, measures have faced a lot of obstacles and this um, is too complicated to explain in the last uh, two minutes of a talk, but it has a lot to do uh, with politics and, and water governance. Um, however, um, as a takeaway to this, and as a, a citizen of not only uh, England but the world, is that there are things that we can do at the individual scale, thinking back to the water footprint calculator, as well as the English scale, um, as well as the global scale in terms of sustainable development goals, that can um, point, put attention to the demand side of the equation and thus trying and thus hopefully alleviate some of the pressure between the supply and the demand gap of water. Um, so I'll leave you all with that. Um, here's some links of the material that we've gone over today. Um, there is a link at the bottom uh, to the Jevons paradox, um, which is one of the challenges actually with the supply side. Uh, the spoiler alert, although I suggest uh, you check it out, is that how is it the case that if you build um, a, a dam, you're actually putting uh, communities um, at potentially higher risk for water shortage. So I'll let that one sink in if you want to learn about that. Uh, kind of the theoretical uh, part of that, that's the Wikipedia link. Um, and if you want to uh, learn about why that's the case from the water side, um, I put a link to the right for water. Um, my Twitter handle is up uh, if anyone wants to, to reach out. Um, and thank you for your time.